having had a bite of this. So this is how we explore mind fleeting, direct experience of what I call the seven hungers. Usually, in America, we would buy a big bag of these if we liked them, and we would sit and watch TV, and we would pop them into our mouth while we were reading or watching TV or playing a video game. <coughs> and we could probably each eat half a bag. In Japan, one of these is served as a tea sweet at the tea ceremony. And these are very old-fashioned tea sweets for the tea ceremony. So this is, this would have been considered a great treat in Japan before we dumped a bunch of sugar into their diet, before the end of World War II. This would have been considered very, very sweet and very satisfying in terms of your sweet tooth. Interesting. So you can eat the rest if you like, or put it aside, save it for later. Right? But savor it. Don't let the mind get in there and judge. Just stay open to the experience. Mind leading also includes eating things you, your mind might say, I don't like, but that doesn't matter. This is a full experience of flavor, texture, smell. And the tea ceremony would be eaten with that kind of mindful awareness. And instead of us feeling like, oh, that's not very much, it expands and becomes much bigger than its small little <coughs> size. It becomes a whole, full experience. Because we approach it not knowing what it is, with curiosity, I'm going to read you something now from a conference that Hogan and I went to. Uh, on, it's called Zen Catholic Dialogue. It was held at a Buddhist monastery in California. And we've been doing it for nine years. And each year there's a different topic. There are 15 Catholics and 15 Buddhists who've been meeting together this long, and we've become very good friends. And each year there's a different topic like... Um, the saint archetype and the bodhisattva archetype. And papers are presented and people discuss the papers. And this year the topic was conversion. When they first proposed the topic, I thought, oh, that's, and I was supposed to write a paper, I thought, hmm, that's interesting because in Buddhism, we don't proselytize. We're not an evangelizing religion or spiritual practice. We wait until people are ready and feel a kinship with Buddhism. And then the doors are open. So I had to look at conversion a different way. What are the fundamental conversions in a spiritual life, in any spiritual life, whether you're Catholic, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, doesn't matter. What are the fundamental conversions that occur in a spiritual life? And one of them is, I call it, conversion is in regard to the locus of our being. Where are we located? Who are we and where are we located? So I'm going to read you a little bit from my paper. The term conversion in Zen connotes conversion from a self-centered life to a Dharma-centered life. The phrase self-centered view is common in Buddhism. It carries no implication of blame, shame, or sin. In this culture we think, oh, self-centered, that's terrible, that's selfish. 
But in Buddhism, self-centered view is simply descriptive. During meditation, when we're able to look with dispassion at our thoughts, we discover that they are all basically centered on I, me, and mine. Like most of our actions are directed at making our individual being, self, safe, successful, and loved. Conversion implies a transformation of the mind and the heart. The ordinary mind thinks that it can protect us from harm, make us safe, successful, and loved through incessant thinking, ruminating about the past, <clears throat> fantasizing about imagined successes, or planning countless futures. The ordinary heart reacts to fear of harm by closing down. Unfortunately, unfortunately, this cloud of constant thinking, together with the tendency to contract the heart, combined to obscure our experience of that which is the ultimate in love and safety. In Christianity, it might be called the experience of God's presence. In Zen, it is called the experience of thusness. The Buddha called himself after his enlightenment, the thus come one, come to thusness, the Tathagata. That was his own description of his own state after awakening. In Zen, conversion is not from something to something else. It is rather an unfolding or an uncovering of what has been true and obvious all along. One of the experiences in mindful eating, oh, oh. Somehow I knew this all along, but I didn't see it, clearly. One purpose of Zen practice is to optimize the conditions for, and even to catalyze, that experience. It could also be called a conversion of frame of reference from self as center to self as peripheral, once our mind opens to all other beings, and no more important than other beings, to self as all other beings and all other creations. This is what Master Thich Nhat Hanh calls interbeing. Doing the mindful eating exercise on looking deeply into our food, you have an experience of interbeing. Becoming aware of the food going into our body and feeding the countless beings living in our body, you have an experience of interbeing. Once a person has experienced this kind of conversion, further practice is needed to maintain the locus of one's life, not in the small mind and its anxieties, but in the boundless mind that permeates everything. Practically speaking, this involves a switch from the habit of constant thinking to the habit of <coughs> dwelling in inner silence, deep listening, and wide awareness. The chant that we were, will do at the end of this talk talks about Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. Dharma gates, the gates from separation into oneness and back from oneness into unique separateness are always open. There are countless gates. But they seem closed from our side. I talked to Father Keating once about this, about centering prayer. And he agreed that this is completely true. That from our side, it seems like there are gates, and the gates are often closed. Knock, knock, how to open them. Frustration, how to open them. But from the other side, from the side of the divine, the absolute, from God's side, there are no gates. Well, from our side there are, and one of the gates, <coughs> one of the gates is eating, when we do it mindfully. So please remember that this gate is always available to you, at least three times a day. And please open that gate, if only for a few minutes, the first sip of tea <coughs> or coffee, the first bite of your pommier. <laughs> Whatever, whatever it is that you're eating, your sandwich, your carrot stick, and opening your awareness fully to that experience, that is a Dharma gate.
where you will find happiness. Thank you.